and welcome to Hell of Presidents. This is another b- 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 bonus coming at you. Uh, in this episode, we are going to talk about the national security state and kind of the offloading of foreign relations responsibilities from the democratic sphere into the more uh, executive branch sphere and how that affects American empire and also the presidency, what they can do, what they can't do, how they are empowered, how they are constrained. Uh, and to do that today, we have with us Danny Bessner. He is uh, at the University of Washington and the author of Democracy in Exile, Hans Speer, and the Rise of the Defense Intellectual. This is mostly going to be a Matt and Danny conversation. Uh, I will be here in the background uh, mostly doing, damn, that's wilds at this, but I might chip in for a, a question or two. If you have any wacky sound effects, that would be great. Yeah, helicopter noise, slide whistle, uh, you know, fart noise from whoopee cushion. I'll be adding those liberally throughout this. Okay, good. Excellent, excellent. Uh, happy to be here, guys. Thanks so much for having me. Of course. So one of the big themes of the show that we've been trying to tease out for the people is the paradoxical nature of a presidential power. As the United States becomes a larger and larger uh, physical uh, mechanism, as, as its power becomes uh, greater, as its uh, bureaucracy becomes more intensified, the American president becomes more powerful in sort of an, uh, a theoretical or abstract sense. Their, their ability to exert control over the world is unprecedented compared to other heads of state at the time or compared to previous generations of presidents as time goes on. But as that process occurs, you have this paradoxical effect whereby as that state gets bigger and more powerful as it first reaches out to grab an entire continent uh, at the end of the 20, 19th century. And then most importantly, after world war two extends its power to become the brainstem of a global empire, uh, that power is also being abrogated away from uh, political responsibility of any case. It's being pulled away from uh, the offices of uh, democratic accountability. And we want to talk today about the process that that took, uh, specifically, uh, after world war two, it really is sort of a, uh, uh, it's a, in, in terms of America's history, uh, there is a seismic nuclear, one would say, uh, uh, elevation in America's power, uh, and also the complexity <laughs> of its, uh, of its foreign policy, uh, and its control over, uh, uh, global economic and military uh, functions uh, that happens as the Second World War ends and basically every other major power in the world is in some sort of ruin. So we let's start there. So World War II saw uh, the uh, United States coordinating Allied victory over over the um, the Axis uh, under the the wise steady leadership of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Absolutely. Uh, who, by uh, the end of the war, is trying to push towards some sort of uh, post-war power sharing agreement, essentially. Absolutely, yes. And, and that's really one of the big what-ifs of history. If Roosevelt doesn't die in April 45, what is the relationship that the United States and Soviet Union have with each other? Because he and Stalin really got along. Uh, and so the, the big question is, if you don't have dumb Harry Truman going in there and, you know, trying to show it to Molotov, you know, and trying to show that he's not just part of the Missouri political machine, he's ready to run this empire and he's not particularly antagonistic and he actually tries to woo Stalin, do you, do you not get a Cold War? And there's a lot of like mainstream historians who really think that could happen. But I think the crucial story that's really you know important to focus on here is the development of the American state. So I'm sure you guys talked about it in all the previous episodes. Wars in American history are, are moments of state consolidation. Absolutely. The Civil War, of course, being a big one, and which is why in the 20th century you have people like Murray Rothbard highlighting the Civil War as the worst thing that happened in the in this country's history. Uh, because it expanded state <laughs> power, right? Like these are, you know, it's yeah. viewed that way. Yeah. Um, and so World War II is really the the the, the foundational moment of, of our current um, of our current period in, in every respect. We're still in a meaningful way. If we were looking back from a thousand years in the future, we're living in the post World War II era right. in, 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 a, in a diversity of ways. Um, and so. 
what happens during World War II is you get what, what is really effectively an emergency state. And, and you could really think about it, and some historians have talked about this, as the, the foreign security, foreign uh, policy, national security element of the New Deal. If the New Deal in the 30s is understood as this domestic uh, process, it's really in World War II and after that you, you get the creation of what might be termed uh, a, a foreign a New Deal for the world, some historians have argued. And that involves the creation of a series of state bureaucracies that are supposed to manage, um, literally, as Matt was talking about, the world. You get the Office of War Information and OSS during World War II, which transform into the CIA. And then most importantly, in 1947, you get the National Security Act, which, as I just said, creates the CIA, uh, but also abolishes the Department of War and Navy to cr uh, create uh, what becomes the uh, Department of Defense. And it, it also creates um, a bunch of these permanent bureaucracies of the American establishment. So you have two things happening at the same time. You you have the creation of this incredibly large state apparatus, and you have the centralization of power in the White House, which has also been occurring since Roosevelt takes uh, takes office in 33, and most famously expressed through the fact that Roosevelt has over 3,000 executive orders, where right. he's really fulfilling this type of American uh, kingship type situation. And, and so what, what you see after World War II are these two processes that are uh, occurring in parallel and that are intersecting and not intersecting at, at, at one time. And I just want to make one final point and then I'll stop, which is that you also have to understand that the American state built after 1945, after World War II, is really strange because it diffuses authority not only through public institutions like within the government like the CIA, but through quote-unquote private institutions like the Rand Corporation and all of these think tanks, which essentially serve as government uh, organizations but actually exist outside the apparatus of the American state. So you have a state that is not only growing more powerful, but that is totally diffused in a bunch of public-private partnerships. Right. So – this is the, the the system that uh, Roosevelt builds over the court, presides over over the course of World War II, and is pretty clearly from the record uh, planning to integrate into a real international system after World War II. A not a headquartered global empire, but it actually diffused like global uh, governing system, which would have involved total decolonization of uh, of the colonized world, uh, and this is. The, as you said, the big what if, it becomes moot when his uh, brain explodes uh, at, at Hot Springs, Arkansas. Uh, I believe uh, his, his, he, he had his, uh, it, FDR is one of those cases like, uh, like Garfield where if he'd lived a little later, things might have gone differently because apparently he was getting his blood pressure checked before he went to uh, take the waters. And it was something like 400 over 250 or something like that. It's like <laughs> he was just a throbbing. He was a thermometer just waiting to go off. And they're, and they're just like, well, you know, go go get in the water. That ought to take care of it. <laughs> so his head explodes. And in, in a cycle that we have seen over and over again uh, in American history, most, most horrifyingly and tragically in the transition from Lincoln to Johnson, we see this transition from FDR, a figure who had been president for longer than anybody in history, who had presided over the transformation of the American state, had in, had uh, had high level uh, talks with everybody in every level of power in all of the other countries, uh, and was had deep personal relationships with them, uh, is replaced by a country bumpkin ass hayseed in the form of Harry Truman. And I don't mean that <laughs> to say I'm not trying to be classist or anything. He was a, he was an ignorant person. He was a uh, he was a, a machine politician from the K Pendergrass machine in Kansas City who was up jumped into the Senate and then got a name for himself for uh, for very public showy um, Senate hearings about war profiteering and then was put on the ticket at the insistence of the party's right wing to neutralize the threat of Henry Wallace, uh, FDR's second and r much and most and much more radical vice president. That's the other part of the what if. If if Wallace stays on the ticket, what do you see then? But genuinely uh, radical, someone who might have actually um, pursued genuine international governance, and who was uh, surrounded by actual communist agents. To which I say, good. <laughs> Maybe we could have done a leveraged buyout between the East and West. It would have been better than what we got. It would not have been tanks rolling down Fifth Avenue. It would not have been gulags in the Finger Lakes. That's all. That was always a fantasy. No matter what, that was never going to happen. But we could maybe have not had a, f a 50 year long war that killed t t tens of millions of people, 25 million people 
for uh, control of its resources and nearly destroy the entire world on multiple fucking occasions. And the Finger Lakes are a very nice region if you're going to build a gulag. Honestly, gulag on the Finger Lakes, not the worst way to go of all the options we have. Yes. So, uh, so that possibility foreclosed. We get Truman. And Truman, the thing about him being a hasty that matters is that he did not know anything. He said after FDR died, he said, I feel like the stars, all the stars and planets are crashing on my shoulders because he was not ready for this any more than Andrew Johnson had been. Uh, and so he was, uh, upon taking office, immediately seized by the same thing that has been the devilment of a lot of presidents, especially as power of the presidency becomes more uh, theoretically vast, which is insecurity and a need to assert oneself. So Truman goes to uh, Potsdam to hash out World War II or the post-war world. And what does he, what does he cook up there? with uh with churchill uh so so then the the question is is what are you going to do with the soviet union right this is the gigantic question of of the last year and uh post world war ii period and i i want to emphasize that i really do think 45 to 47 is a plastic moment i think the structures are set by 47 of a cold war but i do think there's a genuine chance in 1946 uh, 19 early 1947 before march 1947 during the truman doctrine speech um, when he announces what becomes an international cold war for a a sort of detente with the Soviet Union. The idea that these two global powers are going to exist and they're going to be, um, you know, co competition as opposed to war, right? Yeah. And so I think this is what Truman is is uh, thinking about in forty six and forty seven. Uh, but ultimately, what happens is that he and Churchill divide the continent effectively, divide the continent of Europe. Um, with agreement of Stalin between what would become these two blocks. And most importantly, I think it's really critical to think about the micro history of the city of Berlin. So what happens over the course of 1946 um, is that there uh, it's um, let me try to explain. You, you basically have four quarters of the U S British France uh, and the Soviet Union. By the way, it was Berlin. so nice of them to give the French their own section. It's wild. It's that just they like, gave oh, the you got, oh, you guys help too. <laughs> it's it's like when it's like when uh, your family's making dinner and like the the the, the, the youngest kid is like washing a dish and you're like, well, she helped too. That's, yeah, that's the French. and also yes. seat on the yes, Security exactly. Council. So France gets a veto over whatever happens in international politics, which is which is wild. But anyway, so what happens in Berlin is like a series of go going back and forth. Like, you, will you beam propaganda until the Eastern sector? The U.S. and, and U.K. will come together and create the buy zone. Uh, Stalin announces that in a, I think a July forty six speech that there's a competition, inevitable competition between capitalism uh, and communism, and then this all culminates essentially in Truman in March nineteen forty seven. Uh, saying that the United States will aid uh, Greece and, and Turkish rebels against encroaching communists. Uh, and, and more important than that, he announces the general doctrine that they will aid free peoples trying to free themselves from totalitarian states. So this announces to the world that the United States is going to basically fight a Cold War, but it also announces that the United States is really going to try to run international politics in a real way. Yes. And so this period sees the consolidation of these institutions to – guarantee american power beyond a veil of control so it will be american it will be an american empire that they were taking the keys from the europeans from england uk specifically but it will be veiled in a way that the uh the empires of the europe were not and uh so instead of direct rule that you that the europeans favored this new post-war world where propaganda is important where you are fighting for control of hearts and minds all throughout the world and you have a genuine competitive a dynamic and you have rising left wing and the nationalist movements all throughout the former colonized world uh the, the there was no longer uh a viability to the imperial model so these systems are created to perpetuate American power. And I think what's really critical here is also understanding the importance of weapons, because the creation of the atomic bomb essentially allows the United States to govern the entire world through a series of bases. 
So you get a transformation in colonialism from direct rule to what has been called an archipelago of bases around the world. And I think that's really critical to understand because now you don't need masses of troops in the same way you do during Napoleon, right? You could have a series of B-29s and then B-52 bombers, and they could effectively threaten the entire world. So you get a transformation of imperialism that Matt is talking about. And as this is happening, you get the establishment of what becomes called a national security state that essentially provides provides the experts who pull the strings of the empire. Uh, before we move on, can I just go back one thing? Because you saw said or mentioned the importance of uh, the development of propaganda around this. And the way that this is uh, broadcasted to uh, modern Americans is that this was an ideological war, correct? Right. That this was a war between freedom and a totalitarianism. Uh, but really, we know that there is a much more material base to this. And my, uh, you know, again, from, from my limited, uh, <laughs> my, my more, more amateur knowledge, I must assume that this is about keeping markets open that would be closed via the encroachment of communism? I think it's both. So I think ultimately the causal element is always the material. But I do think these people bought their own bullshit. I think they were genuinely like, fuck, the United States needs to run the world, otherwise you're going to get another Hitler. Yeah. Right? The, the confrontation with Nazism really turns a generation of people into what we would today call like a little deranged, yeah. frankly. They really cold see warriors. monsters everywhere. Yeah. yeah, cold warriors. I mean, and up until the Iraq War, you people brought out Munich, for Christ's sake. I mean, it, it was the dominant paradigm. But, of course, it's in the service of this scramble for resources. And, of course, there's an, intellect, there's an ideological justification for that. Well, we need those markets to keep fighting the war. But time and again, we see that the actual generator of action is – the relation of the the given uh, economy of the given country in pl in in question towards American uh, corporate uh, capitalism. Absolutely, and then you get the this is the the real period of like you know the direct intervention of the United States around the world. So since 1776, the country has uh, has participated in 500 interventions. 250 of those happen after 1945. Yeah, right. So this is the entrance of the American uh, you know actor onto the world stage in a genuine way. And it's interesting to note that they plan this from as early I think as the fall of France in the summer of 1940, because the fall of France basically persuaded the Americans that they needed to. Uh, lay astride world history by dominating uh, the world. So through World War II, they do things like get the British to give them base rights, right? Begin preparing for this global mm -hmm. empire, which they create. And so the uh, military nerve system of this is headquartered in the Pentagon, built after the war, the largest office building in the world. Uh, its intelligence network uh, is established with the CIA and the, later the NSA. Uh, and then, of course, you have the think tanks, the RAND corporations that exist to uh, further create more like lobes of, of, uh, of deliberation within this machine, uh, more uh, ways to uh, absorb and analyze information. And think tanks were the woke, were sort of the woke places of their time, uh, right? It's in think tanks where the, this is a thing I think people don't realize, it's where basically marginalized populations entered the American, um, the sort of the elite of the American empire, right? It's it's the places where, where Jews or women are able to find work and through those the work and that connection at places like the Rand Corporation are actually able to enter into the American state. So it's also interesting because this is the moment, and Matt, I know you like this, where where the WASP elite gives up its power to Catholics and Jews. Yes. Right. So it's a really they interesting thing. They turn over the thing. keys to the Mercedes. They really did. They'll be at the bar. <laughs> it's, and it's, it's, it's phrased in this language of empire, you know, it's, it's, it's wild. Um, and I think that's that's a really uh, interesting part of the story. The offloading onto these uh, think tanks also can provide the veneer of like a, uh, a mathematical or a rationalist uh, engine for all of this, because that's what they peddle that they, uh, you know, are doing the research, are, do, are putting out white papers, are, are using science and math. Yeah, the crackpot realism that C. Yeah. Wright Mills talks about. Right. Where you like create a paradigm game. of insanity, but you are able to fill it within it uh, with, by, by the terms of rationality, a compelling explanation. Exactly. And this is the period where the, you get the development of game theory, you know, game theoretical explanations of war, which is really important to how people... It's time for some... Game, game theory. theory. Yes. <laughs> uh, but it, 
It's really it's it's uh, it's created in 1942 by two German exiles, Austrian ex- exiles actually, um, and then it's taken up by the Rand Corporation in 1948, and you get the creation of the first big war games. You get the the first use of game theory applied to problems of war, and so this stuff is then sent to the Pentagon, right? And the and the Pentagon, oh, I did that thing I hate <laughs> with the right. It's sent to the Pentagon. It is, uh, and then the Pentagon starts using these sorts of rational analyses, which are then deployed in Vietnam. Right. Uh, or in, in Iraq, right? And so you get this this rationalization of war, which is, of course, directly related to how liberals fight war through, quote-unquote, clean war, like atomic bombs. And atomic bombs were initially read as clean because they destroyed things much quicker than a, you know, a trench campaign or like today. The guillotine. Exactly. That was the, the guillotine. Exactly. It's all the same thing. Yep. It's a, going Great point. Going back to the 18th century, there's all these liberal fantasies about basically using weapons and technology to humanize war. And this is a big thing about World War II because the state that they build, it's progressive. It literally emerges from people who think that they're like going to use rational management to literally manage the globe. It's the Voltaire's bastards thing. Yeah. It's really and crazy. That, that's why I really think that the if you want to understand conservatives and liberals within like the, the sphere of uh, the political mainstream and the exercise of power uh, generally, it's, it's not – it doesn't make sense to speak of them. It, it makes sense to speak of them as a spectrum but not as a spectrum – uh, away from like a central point, but as a, a spectrum of uh, time and space in distance from the point of capitalism. The right is oriented mentally towards the actual machinery of exploitation that makes up this system that we live under. Liberals are temporally and spatially removed from it. And so they their politics are about rationalizing their place in the system through the creation of intervening mechanisms that legitimize the violence. It's super structural, um, yes. I think. And I think that that in at this period of time, if we talk about the left, this is really, I think, the last moment of potential labor radicalism in the United yes, States in, in a real sense, because it's uh, and I know people are going to disagree and, you know, it's. Whatever. Uh, I think what happens is that labor through the Cold War makes a concordat with capital. Yes. <laughs> effectively. Absolutely. And I think that that is the last moment when capital the strike been- wave of the late 40s. Exactly. The, the, the post war era is defined by two strike waves one in the late 40s, one in the early 70s. And one is the opening, is the last like stand of, of the working class. And then uh, the signing of a treaty basically with capital. And then the second one is once that treaty has been violated, the last embers of the movement trying to reassert themselves before being crushed. Exactly. And then especially in, in the late 40s and early 50s, uh, the empire, the initiate, initial imperial project domestically is a full em- employment program. Can you imagine a fucking the, the strike wave of the late 40s with Henry Wallace as president? That's that is because like the, the question of of of. Um, the ability, the power of a president to move meaningfully left, right, which is what we pre- preoccupy ourselves in when we talk about where there is power in the presidency. It is enti- it is lar- it is ninety nine percent contingent on whatever the popular energy exists to to uh, be channeled by the, that office. The office itself can't do it. I would say that the Kennedy administration is an example of someone trying to assert some sort of reforming tendency from within the machine, but with no popular support, which meant it was neutered from the get-go. Uh, you had energy there. That's why the post-Civil War era is incredibly uh, fervent and, uh, and and prote in that way, and as is that moment after World War II. But the, the door closes with the atomic bomb, with the ascension of Truman, and with the assertion of this new American empire, which will be affirmed through a massive military the uh, economic engine of the war economy transitioning into a post-war military build-up economy, Keynesian stimulus through the military-industrial complex, uh, and then economically, this new global uh, capitalist empire that will be headquartered in the United States will be asserted uh, through the dominion of the U.S. dollar, which was uh, the dominion of the U.S. dollar, which was affirmed at the Bretton Woods conference. And it's so crucial because you basically have this argument develop over the 30s and the 40s. Uh, The big question is what caused the Great Depression? And and the United States' top economists all conclude is because there was no world leader. So like from from very early in the (laughs) 30s, uh, you get basically a project to to make the United States the – 
center of the international economy. And that is linked to what has been called um, the dollar diplomacy, right? It happened first in, in Latin America and then expanded to the entire world. Um, and so you, you, these two sorts of logics merge together between the security and the economic under the new rubric of what begins to be called national security. That itself is a concept that dates only to the post-World War II period. And what it does is it, 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 it literally um, – uh, uh, um, alienates one from what's actually going on because it obscures it, reaf it. It obscures the fact that 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 sort of economic and security logic are different, and they have different causal things. But it's all comes together under national security. Because at Bretton Woods, which es established the dollar as the global reserve currency, that would that would it kept the gold standard, but the the gold standard through the instrument of the U.S. dollar. Uh, been, and that would have existed until Nixon finally got rid of gold convertibility uh, in the 70s. Uh, and that was not the only option. Uh, John Maynard Keynes was alive and he was at Bretton Woods and he said, hey, uh, if we're transition transacting uh, global, if we're doing global uh, trade transactions, should it really be denominated in a sovereign country's currency? That seems to give them an overwhelming influence uh, within the system. Why don't we have a global currency that is used just for trade and that might be pegged to the dollar? Or he said, I believe, a basket of commodities. Uh, and uh, everyone said, that's very nice, John. Uh, go, go play in the yard. <laughs> And the same thing with the UN, right? The UN, <laughs> yes, which, was, yes, exactly. which was presented as sort of this global parliament, was actually literally just uh, the the iron glove in, uh, of Amer the iron hand of American imperialism inside the velvet glove of internationalism. Yes. And so you basically create this sort of a sued international community with the IMF, you know, the General Agreement for Tariffs and Trade, um, the the UN, the the Bretton Woods system that that it seems internationalist. It's clothed in a progressive liberal guise, but is actually actually just hiding total U.S. domination, which is, I should add, run by several hundred people in Washington, D.C. It's literally, that is what's happening. A very small elite running the entire world under the sort of threat of atomic annihilation. And crucially, all of them unaccountable in any way to the democratic process, because none of these people are elected. They compose what is can accurately be described as the deep state, because they persist beyond the whim of of uh, the the party politics, and they are in a fundamental way independent even of presidential authority. Even though these are all concentrated in the executive, uh, 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 the executive s side of power theoretically, and the president does have the ability to uh, appoint and then oversee their actions. In reality, there is almost no point of uh, of accountability because uh, it's up to them because of the. Because of the intricacy of the diplomacy and of the, the spycraft and of the economic uh, actions uh, and because of their secrecy, there is no obligation of any of these institutions to be forthcoming with what they're actually doing. And there's also just the fact of technological possibility, right? Being far away actually gave you more freedom. So over the course of the late 40s and early 50s, there's a, the legal apparatus of essentially secret warfare is justified through a series of National Security Council acts, particularly National Security uh, NSC-4 and NSC-4A, which essentially legalized subversive warfare in the world. So you have essentially a, a group of people in the CIA who, who are running around the world doing things we literally don't know about because they're still classified. But the big ones we do know about are pushing the Italian elections to make sure the communists don't win, yep. uh, telling the East Germans that the, that the United States will support them if they rebel, which turned out to not be the case. Oops. Uh, helping the uh, the, uh, <laughs> the British over... Yeah, big oops. Helping the British overthrow Mossadegh in Iran and then helping uh, the... Uh, um, and then overthrowing on behalf of American corporate interests Jacob Arbenz in Guatemala, who did some mild land reforms. So you get the establishment of a security state that is connected to the executive, but is developing its own power source, its own networks in this new global American empire. So we have a situation where theoretically the president could end all life on, uh, as we know it, by pressing a button. But in this era now with Truman and then Eisenhower in this new forming system, how much, act how much do these guys even A, know what's going on and B, have influence over decisions that are actually made? It's difficult to know because they know certain th they they know a general thing. We're going to psychological warfare the Soviet Union, but what that means in practice, right? They often don't know. That could mean anything from 
uh, again, a lot of this is still classified, but trying to like overload and delay their system through um, broadcasts. It could be assassinations. It could be an economic warfare, you know, printing Sami's dot essentially. Um, so on that level, no, the presidents usually are unaware. Um, and you see the problem is these national, the information comes from national security council transcripts, which are just summaries oftentimes. Mm -hmm. So, and obviously they're, they're, uh, they're censored even beforehand. So it's, right. it's difficult to know, but th you could imagine that there is a growing knowledge gap between the executive, which has incredible power and a state, which also is developing incredible power. So uh, what we see is, is these development of these bureaucracies that through their very nature, it tend to accrue power oh, into their own independence. But I guess my main question is, was there a, uh, you know, an identifiable moment or hinge point in which, you know, they were basically unleashed under Truman or Eisenhower, I, I would assume, like the 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 moment on which the, the ball started rolling. I, it's usually considered the National Security Act, right? There, I'd say there's two moments, the National Security Act, which literally creates the institutions and the Korean War. Oh, yeah. Which, which basically fills them with. Yeah, because you don't have money. <laughs> you have a structure. Yeah. You have to actually have a funding source yeah. and like a raise out debt to move to fill the institution with like uh, exactly its, its own coherence yeah so a diplomat named paul nitza produces a document i believe in april or march uh, 1950 basically saying that we need to fund the cold war that the cold war is this existential struggle and we need to provide money that document is ignored until june 1950 with the outbreak of the korean war and Mac macarthur's march to the yalu <laughs> which uh and it must be pointed out that the korean war was a case of self-conscious incitement on the behalf of the of the american uh government and its puppet regime in south korea it's testing the waters in a real way because america wants to become the hegemon in each east asia which it did become and korea is a test ground for that which is why in many cases the the intensity of korean intra intra-peninsular politics is, is so intense because it really served as this battleground of the cold war from very early on and this is the point i want to make about how there is this paralysis uh, of um presidential power throughout the system so we know at the tactical level why they can't really know because there's too much going on it's too fast it's too high tech there's too many nodes there's only one head uh there's a question of secrecy there's a question of institutional self-interest they can't do it tactically but at the grand strategic level they're also totally hemmed in by this cold war paradigm like take the korean war for example we have a situation where the u.s was uh, self-consciously instigating conflict with the North to see where the line was, to see what could happen in a general uh, uh, environment where everyone understood that some sort of conflict with the Soviets needed to be provoked in order to set the context for the coming struggle. Uh, and I can't believe that at any point Harry Truman himself wanted a war in Korea. It was a fuck. It was the headache of his fucking administration. It was a gigantic. He had to fucking have. He had to yell at. Uh, he had to deal with fucking MacArthur puking on his front yard. He didn't want the Korean War, but once the, those uh, unbeknownst uh, feelers ex spring the trap and you've got uh, communist troops flooring over a border, well, then your options are literally non-existent. And he was, of course, hemmed in by MacArthur. Yes. He basically disobeyed orders. Mm -hmm. So you have this emergent state in the person of MacArthur because, again, uh, Japan is far away. You know, it's yeah. difficult to control that literally, especially at the time. So you have a a, a standoff between the emer this emergent security state and and Truman. And Truman eventually wins because I think MacArthur overstepped his bounds, or there was Eis I Eisenhower saves a lot of things because he's a general who's willing to abide by the the civilian. I also system. they didn't really think that the Chinese were going to fuck. They weren't going to invade. They they thought they were going to call their bluff. And then Ma was like, "Yeah, I got a lot of people." Uh, some of them can guy in Korea. That's fine. Yeah, a ton of <laughs> a ton of Chinese soldiers died. Yeah, uh, and uh, and that was died, something yeah. that I think MacArthur was pretty much uh, uh, assuming would not happen. Right. No, for sure. And then Mac MacArthur like sends a letter to Congress, which is read on the floor, insulting the Truman administration's yeah. policy, uh, <laughs> and, and Truman tells him like not to advance, and he does. Yeah. Um, it's it's just a lot of back and forth. But what happens to speak to the larger theme is that the president does emerge as still an intact is still the commander in yes. chief at the at the end of the struggle with macarthur and which and which then after truman's term uh second full term uh that ends with the inevitability which is the ascension of uh the military man the man on a horse to consolidate these contradictions which is a, another cycle of american history from washington to grant this is what we do after a big paroxysm we put a man in a uniform to consume to uh 
uh, represent the entire state and its struggle and sublimate all of the incredibly powerful contradictions that cannot be addressed. Uh, Eisenhower's ascension to the uh, presidency is an example of this uh, perfectly. So you have, after uh, the end of the, the war, uh, uh, a Republican base that is fully convinced, as they were before World War II, of the necessity for uh, isolationism. Uh, and Taft represented Eisenhower. by the figure of Ohio Senator Robert Taft, father of the Taft-Hartley bill, uh, the man who is essentially the knight errant of the, uh, the northern smallholder. So this is this, he is the, the heir of the, the yeoman tradition left in America, which says our state keep, keeps getting bigger the more we internationalize our power. We're going to reaffirm our power over our sovereignty. And of course, the guys in D.C. and Washington know that that is idiocy. That is ideological fantasy. You cannot have American democracy without this empire. You cannot have your little corner shops and your, and, and hey, Mr. Welch, you can't have your fucking candy factory in Massachusetts if we do not have this system. And so you have to be coddled because you are influential and make up the actual like nerve and, and, and bone of this political party that is part of the machinery of control of America. But you absolutely cannot be in charge of this thing. And so at the convention where uh, uh, Taft was the huge favorite among the actual uh uh, base the wall street uh big shots parachute in with the winner of world war ii dwight d eisenhower a man who had never voted a man who was courted by both parties to run for president and chose the republicans i think because of his uh honestly probably his style more than anything and his love of golf which is true of all the horseback guys most of them never because they would have acted differently it could have been macarthur if macarthur wasn't a political creature and we didn't get the MacArthur coup that liberals were afraid of. Instead, we got Eisenhower, which amounted to the same thing. Joe Biden. but Exactly. But on a slower time scale. So all those liberals, all those Dean Acheson people who were terrified of, of, the, of the revanche in the form of MacArthur, they thought that they dodged a bullet. And now we got genial old uh, G uh, Dwight. But he's the same creature garbed differently. Absolutely. It's Dwight Eisenhower, of course, who really solidifies the security state. But I just want to say one thing about Taft because I think that's a 52 is a really critical moment in, in the history of modern conservatism because that anti imperial conservatism, that sort of smallholder conservatism, goes uh, su uh, underground essentially. And you only see it later with people like Pat Buchanan and then Donald Trump. Yes, exactly. He is the return of Taft. He is the revenge of Robert it, Taft. It's a revanchist. It's, it's exactly. So it's a ressentiment. Yeah. In, in, a, in a genuine uh, way. But just, and then with Eisenhower, Matt, you're exactly right. It's Eisenhower who institutionalizes psychological warfare. It's Eisenhower who, who, who tries to do some rollback in the Soviet Union. It, it's Eisenhower who basically solidifies the military industrial complex uh, and the sort of uh, scientific technological elite there that, that are embodied in places like the Rand Corporation. Um, and this is what his final uh, farewell address is, is, of course, addressed to. It's against the military industrial complex and everyone remembers that but the second part was against the scientific technological elite by which he really means the deep state yeah this sort of deep state which will of course become very powerful during the administration of jfk and that speech which people love might be the most exemplary speech of any american president if you want to make somebody understand the presidency play them that speech because eisenhower meant what he said he didn't have any incentive to say it he was leaving office he, he could have said anything this is a he is saying, War be wary of the deep state and the military industrial complex after having spent eight years giving it sinew and breathing life into it. <laughs> At every point, thinking he was making the conservative choice, thinking he was moving away from these consolidations, thinking he was making the less bad option, and all of it added up to the creation of a monster that all he could do in his powerless twilight is say, hey, somebody else, you better watch out for this thing. <laughs> Literally, that's what it was because what happens, and I think Matt, that's so crucial because what happens after 45 is you get a, a small C conservative reaction to the New Deal state understood yes. both in its domestic and international aspects. And what happens is that small C conservatism pushes the state into that parastatal element where you get places like Rand and the entire structure of think tanks, where you get places like MI, at, at, at big universities like MIT, oh, which yeah. are funded by the CIA, Stanford. right? Stanford. Um, you, you, you get essentially the security state entering into these parastatal 
statal institutions, the universities, the think tanks, the mind of the empire, and giving it all this money. And uh, interestingly enough, there's and this is, I think, the paradox of this whole era, because in this country, we only get social democratic reform through militarism, through national security. So you get the largest expansion of American education, the National Defense Education Act of 1958 after Sputnik, right? So you see the justification of all of these good things like funding languages for people to study all of these languages for free um, are, are only justified, social democratic reforms only justified through this national security logic. And we're seeing it right ha happen right now with China. It's the exact same thing is happening. It's a thing that's recurrent in Amer American history. Yeah, at every point, we need a military uh, justification for our economic structure. Uh, and that's why the uh, Persian Gulf War is so crucial, because it, it helped uh, establish the terms of American dominion after the fall end of the Cold War to prevent the reevaluation of America's political economy and say, hey, maybe we don't. The word peace dividends, people stopped using it after uh, the Persian Gulf War. And even though you had the floundering of the 90s, uh, then 9-11 shows up. And I and I have to, and that's the thing about this structure. So we we are seeing over this over the course of this period, the emergence of this machine that is outside of democratic accountability. We're, I mean, in any sense, no one knows what's happening. And even if they did, they'd have no one to vote for to stop it. Because to vote for someone is to involve yourself in the very structure that has removed these uh, these pl these vectors from encounter with power. Uh, and then you see, you live in a, the country that is marked by that, who is marked by uh, first the creation of this post-war Keynesian uh, uh, welfare state, then its slow and steady and vicious dismantlement. And something you, really interesting is that you see over the course of the mid 20th century, the, the defining down of democracy. Whereas if you talked about democracy in the 20s or the 30s, there was a sense of economic democracy, of social democracy, right? But over the course of the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, you get cohorts of people, cohorts of intellectuals who are training, you know, you get this is a big expansion of the university, the bureaucrats go to the universities now, training the people who run these this state in the idea that democracy means one thing and that's voting, i.e. it's choosing your elites. And so this is essentially what becomes the defining feature of American democracy, which is why when American does imperial adventures abroad, it always emphasizes voting. You guys remember in Iraq, right, with the purple, you know, yes, on the, the fingers, fingers, right? Because voting is seen as equivalent to democracy, where it is anything but, you know, I'm sure as this show has demonstrated. Well, of course. I mean, that is why after the Civil War, the most conservative Republicans, the ones who wanted to reset up uh, the South along free labor lines, not push forward with the class struggle the way the more radical Republicans like uh, Benjamin Butler and uh, Thaddeus Stevens wanted, they insisted upon not redistribution of land to free slaves, but the uh, uh, securing of the franchise. They said, give, give the Negro the vote. They don't need land. And if we turned out, it turns out, oh, no, that's where the actual power comes from, is from the control of resources. It's not the rituals of democracy. But that's all we have now. That's all we have now. And that is why, and I want to get back to the point I was trying to start with, is, is that is why we now find ourselves in a, in, a, in a world where the only play to express the reality of this is through the language of and the narratives of conspiracy theory. You, you find the points where the thing moved in one direction, broke in one direction, and it so perfectly mirrors the interests at play that we think it had to have been that. And 9-11 is, of course, one of those. Oh, my God. What are, we have a crisis of legitimacy of our post-war Keynesian military state. We sure could use, as the uh, Project for a New American Sensory said, a new Pearl Harbor. And then what do you know? We got one. And the <laughs> first event that really forged that, and Pearl Harbor did too. It had, But those were just cranks because everyone liked World War II. The first real event that does this, that becomes the way that we could psychically express our understanding of our loss of power that we could no longer express politically because the, that's gone, is the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Because uh, there is obviously a very real sense that you can chart after the dissolution of a lot of uh, public belief in institutions with the death of Kennedy. You see a general disenchantment with their, uh, their sense of their control over their destinies over the course of the 60s and 70s. And a lot of that is, is put at the foot of uh, Vietnam and its consumption of the American, uh, 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 the American budget, the American project in general, and the way that that just it, it destroyed any uh, hope of a progressive movement uh, through the contradictions of the welfare state. And they look back and they see, here's this guy, uh, young president, not a member of uh, any of the structures of power coming in on a popular 
uh, if not a electoral mandate, a, a cultural mandate uh, to change and uh, coming into real conflict with these new apparatuses of power and trying to push against them uh, and, and, and challenge the, the uh, challenge, the shape of the presidential uh, containment on, on, on the questions of war and peace. I think that's exactly right. And so the real question of Kennedy or what makes Kennedy who he was is that it seems like he genuinely wanted liberalism to live up to its best right. image of itself, right? right? With the Alliance yeah. for Progress or sort of the creation of a more genuinely multilateral order, particularly after the Cuban Missile Crisis, you know, with some form of early detente with the Soviet Union. So this is the big question of his last year of life right yeah. he's a little more hawkish until the, i think the cuban missile crisis really is like holy fuck yeah this really almost happened and like i, w I won't do that um and so after that there's a different kennedy and so the big question is i think the kennedy assassination followed by vietnam so quickly yeah you know that it's really you get this one two punch of the 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 dream of liberalism in the beautiful camelot of kennedy literally shot in the head uh and then you have the 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 failure of liberal imperialism in sort of the the death trap of vietnam and i think after that you you have the beginning of an era where people don't even believe in the project really any longer, except in its most cynical right. Reaganite way. And I think that we're living in the post post hangover era now. Right. You know, you're touching on Vietnam as an a moment of you know disillusionment in the public, but where does Vietnam as a process fit into this consolidation? Right. So no, it does because basically the answer it's where decolonization meets the Cold War. Um, and it's where you know mm -hmm. a living uh, East a Southeast Asian communism is confronted with various forms of capitalist imperialism, and so I think the the story of Vietnam is really the story in micro of the entire 20th century, um, and it's it's interesting that it's a, a story that ends in American retreat. I don't, what do you think about Vietnam? Uh, I think you can see yeah Vietnam as the point where this this machine that was built after World War II uh, had to burst forth of burst out of its constraints. It had to pour out onto something. All of that milit as Hitler learned, you can't keep building up forever. You have to use your military stores because they become redundant. And we had we got had reached that point and we had also reached a point where the contest over control of the post-colonial world was heating the fuck up. The, the, this is the same period that the uh, CIA is uh, staging the coup and genocide in Indonesia in order to make sure that the communism doesn't take root in uh, Asia. A, a, the third largest communist party in the world was in Indonesia. They were the opposition party, essentially. They were, or they were part of the coalition that had kept uh, the uh, post-colonial uh, Suharto regime in power. And the same time that they're being massacred uh, is the same time that you see the full commitment to uh, a military project in South Vietnam. And I think Chomsky's right. It denies an example. Uh, and it also provides a place to spend a lot of fucking money on weapons. And it also <laughs> serves as, as you know, what Greg Grandin, exactly what Greg Grandin referred to in another context as uh, a workshop of empire. Right. Yes, you know, exactly. Because what happens is Project you get, Phoenix is now how they run uh, crime stopping in the urban cities. Exactly. And it's, it's, it's where you get to test out all these psychological theories, these psychological strategies. You get to test out forms of imperialism, strategic hamlets. You get to move a lot of heroin, too. You get to take <laughs> a lot of black budget money up by, by dealing fucking fucking heroin yeah no abs uh, and so you get all of these um different you know you, you get to test out what becomes a sort of disciplinary structure of american uh empire at home abroad right. first and who who you know who becomes the cops in the 1960s a lot of veterans or yes. at least people informed by sort of this imperial image right. and i think you see a lot of you know recent writing coming out really demonstrating that that vietnam is, is experience is so critical for the militarization of american cities but what, what's even more interesting is how the peace corps comes home with things like teach for america yes. Yeah. And Absolutely. you get like sort of the neoliberalization of all of these internally colonized peoples. That's true. You the NGOification of the inner cities. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And it's directly connected to this American imperial moment, right? And in a way, Vietnam really makes modern American liberalism the thing we criticize so much. What it what it was. So how how this was inevitable once Johnson becomes president is self evident. This is. The question of Johnson's role, uh, Johnson's relation to Vietnam is, I think, almost overdetermined psychologically. Like another country bumpkin thrown into the deep end of world affairs, wildly insecure relative to his knowledge and understanding compared to the defense establishment intellectuals surrounding him. Uh, 
very ambitious in attempting to fulfill the promise of the welfare state, but also beset by an anti-communist uh, uh, paranoia uh, paranoia that ha- that defined domestic politics and limited his uh, his amount his ab- his ability to maneuver there, which demanded that he reassert his anti-communist credentials internationally. Uh, we know why that happened. The question is, and the question that has dominated uh, a lot of people's minds for the past, uh, what, 60 years now, is would John F. Kennedy, had he lived, pursued the same course? Is Do we have, I think, do we have a compelling case in, in the evidence that uh, can be made that if Kennedy had lived, he would have resisted the the pull towards escalation in Vietnam? And uh, would he have been able to sustain that given the complete orientation around every other uh, bureaucratic uh, and uh, imperial structure of government towards that end of conflict in Vietnam. And so this question, in my opinion, really, this is like a history podcast, so let's get history. Oh, baby. It really turns on the question is why do you think he uh, um, allowed the assassination of ZM? Yeah. That's the big question, right? So a lot of people have used that to argue that he would have escalated right because it demonstrates a commitment, a commitment. it's like Sam is alienating too many people let's get somebody else in exactly there. right so this is the real question is like how steinbrenner calling uh calling down to uh billy martin and tell him and that makes the guy bunt right exactly exactly and so then the question is does how long does he fund south vietnam yeah. right and so the americans did it for another you know that's really what they spent a lot of their time and money doing in addition to fighting the war and so I don't know. It, it from my perspective, it doesn't look good. It, that demonstrates some sort of commitment. So are you going to escalate in sixty four, sixty five, right yeah. during that winter? Yeah. Um, I don't know. Hard to know because the thing we can't know. We can we can maybe sketch out what Kennedy's uh, strategy would have been because there is a larger argument that not only did he want to resist escalation in Vietnam, he wanted to pursue genuine detente with the Soviets. He wanted to actually change the terms of, of conflict between the two sides. I think that's true. And that would be a, a change that the system, frankly, could not sustain. And this is, to me, the crucial question of his assassination, is that you can say he would have tried to make liberalism fulfill its own mandate had he lived, but he was killed by the state, the deep state, to prevent that. But we know, or at least I think I'm pretty confident in saying that it could not have done that liberalism could not do the things that liberals wanted it to do. It was, it was a too riven in contradiction to allow that. And Kennedy's play for a changing the terms had no popular base to reflect. It was a complacent political uh, generation at that point. There was nobody there to, to really uh, unite with in conflict with this new colossus. I think it could have, uh, I think you're right. I think it's too riven with contradictions, but I think it could have, Still been riven with contradictions and not have had the extraordinary violence of Vietnam. Right. Uh, I you think could that have pulled was it down. Old could men, have, the same way that at every point war. there could have been a beveling away. Like maybe Henry Clay getting in instead of James K. Polk bevels us away from uh, a final apocalyptic conflict over slavery because it holds back westward expansion. Maybe uh, if Lincoln instead of uh, Johnson had. Uh, been able to been present over, during Reconstruction, it bevels us away from the uh, existential totality of race as the, the predominating political identity in America. And after World War II, you have this beveling away from a uh, a coordinated uh, global uh, government that incorporates the Soviets and Americans within like a a uh, a system of uh, of non domination, and then we get with uh, Kennedy. Uh, a, a chance to bevel away from the most uh, hysterical violence of the Cold War. And it's amazing that at every point, it goes one way. It goes in the wrong direction. Now, of course, that's because <laughs> we're in the middle of options. We're not the best or worst. But we're definitely at every point branching in the wrong direction. And some of it is acts of God and randomness, but others of them, like the Kennedy assassination, tell some people this is the system defending itself. We can ask ourselves, what would Ke- what would the deep state, what would uh, the defense establishment have done if Kennedy had pursued that? And they answer, we know what they would have done. They would have killed him. And that, to me, is the, the great open question. And the very fact that we can't know is the important one to me. Because this is my, I think, the most important thing about Kennedy's assassination. Because at the end of the day, who did it is just a historical curiosity. What happened after is what we need to understand. Uh, is that no matter who killed Kennedy, what matters is that none of the people, I would say, 
who occupied the White House after him or sought it at a high level believe that. That nobody, even if it was Oswald, and I'm honestly not unconvinced, I'm not totally convinced it wasn't just Oswald. Or honestly, Oswald plus the uh, George Hickey, the circuit service agent in the car behind Kennedy, standing up too fast with his AR-15 and accidentally shooting him in the head, which is another theory of the assassination that actually has a lot of forensic uh, evidence to back it up. But anyway, <laughs> yeah, this is this isn't a Kennedy assassination hour because God knows we can go deep in that. Johnson didn't think the Warren Commission was right. Nixon didn't. Uh, I know for a fact that John Kerry, who ran for president and almost became president, didn't think that. And so. Everybody who pursues that office after that has in their head the knowledge that there are places where if you stray, you might get got. Because even having the question, did my own government that I'm supposed to be in charge of kill this guy and not being able to say no, not being able to be like, of course not, it, it exposes the reality, which is that these things, these institutions are truly beyond your power. And that is... That means everybody who pursues that power and everybody who exercises it, it has that control already in their head so that beyond the limitations of democratic, uh, you know, uh, the, of democratic influence in a political structure, even the personal discretion of the president is mitigated by that question, that unanswered question of could the government have done that? And if they could, then what could they do to me? And it means that even at the personal psychological level, our rulers are post that uh event uh uh harnessed not to uh undercut the undercut the profound point you were making there matt but it really just makes me wonder what uh donald trump thinks about the kennedy assassination <laughs> and if he had internalized that as well for how uh you know b b bubble-headed he is it was bet midler she did it. you know just imagine he'd be like they, they, wouldn't, up, they, they might have done up, it to kennedy they wouldn't do it to me washed up hag bet midler Oh, I guarantee, because the thing about Trump is that Trump is one of those guys who always has to be a smart guy. He's always got to know the score, which means he has to know the most cynical interpretation of anything. That would be my so guess. So he absolutely yeah. thinks Kennedy was killed there. A hundred percent. There was no doubt that Trump thinks that. And I bet he tried to look. Oh, yeah, for him. sure. He yeah. asked Kennedy. So I doubt it. But then they said, here it is. And it was like a, a fucking drawing of the grassy knoll and crayon. He's like, okay, because he couldn't, he can't care about anything long enough to pursue it. Absolutely not. Yeah. Yeah. Because we've, because he is the end result. Him and Biden now are the end result of a system that selects for people who are at every level that they pursue power, learning about what power is, which means by the time you get to the end point, you know what you're getting into, which means now we're in a situation where the only people who will meaningfully pursue presidential power will have been drained of any civic virtue, any, any vision of politics, even personal autonomy. They just want to seek the light. They want to embody the power because they've either... Uh, they're well, they just the most, they're the most uh, demonically uh, uh, narcissistic person in human history Absolutely. and the, yes. the president's the most famous person on earth. So they have to be president <laughs> true, or yeah. it's something that they're, that they gave, they swore to their dying wife they were going to do. And then they had a hemorrhage when they were running for president <laughs> 30 years ago. And now their mental pathways have been fucking uh, turned into concrete. And all they can think of is being president. That's it. There could be no other animating principle because we know where the power lies in this system. Uh, and 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 all the big questions, it lies outside of the White House. And I think that's the story of the post-Vietnam era. I think you see this this transition to neoliberalism in, in every way. And let's just talk about the security stuff. You see essentially the ending of mass politics in terms of the military and the creation of the all-volunteer uh, force yes. in the early 1970s, right? So just as like the masses are being hollowed out in the industrial core of this country, the military is being hollowed out of the bourgeoisie. Yep. So you get the creation of an all-volunteer for force, which is the greatest gift that was given to American militarists because it essentially allowed you to run an empire without having the people who consume from that empire. We haven't talked about consumption, but it's very critical oh, here. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, the people who consume from that empire not fighting the sort of brush fire wars yeah. of the empire. And I think that's a direct result of the large anti-Vietnam War student protest movement, which happens to kind of trail off when the war strategically switches yeah, to bombing. It, 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 and then once the uh, they end the the draft ends. You see it just a collapse. You see a collapse of uh, of anti war activism. Right, because it's basically the boomers are now getting they're in their twenties. They're they're being they're buying houses. They're having kids. They're controlling whatever nineteen percent of the wealth. It's a totally different generational experience, and it becomes totally disconnected from American empire. Um, which is why I mean. 
there's there's a sort of strange movement of the anti-war movement into the anti-nuclear movement, and it sort of spurs up and down every now and again, but it's really dissipated in American society. Whereas in the 19th and early 20th century, the, you know, the uh, working men's pacifist leagues were very, very important. It just sort of dies after Vietnam it's, as a mass phenomenon. Yes, because uh, as you, I, I want to get to consumption. That's the engine of this uh, domestically. So the president is being uh, uh, both empowered and disempowered in his ivory throne. But at the grassroots, uh, politics is being contained by, uh, by consumption, by the creation of a consumer society. The America, America at, the begin, at the middle of a global system of resource extraction and then manufacture and consumption, where they both uh, – they where – Resources are extracted elsewhere at the at the point of maximum exploitation of labor and then are brought to the metropole, the United States, where they are then manufactured on basis of a minimal alienation. It was still, you know, you're being exploited, but you got a house in the suburbs. You've got you've got a car in the garage. You can you your wife doesn't have to work. Right. This is the gray flannel suit, you know, the yes. organization man. Yes. Like you either like, yes, there is still a class society, but now it's. You, one 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 guy gets to be a lawyer and the other guy it's uh, lives in the, it lives in the gutter. It's one guy gets to be an ad man, one guy gets to be a factory worker, but they get to live in the same neighborhood and they get to have basically the same consumer experience. And w the experience of living class in America is replaced by the experience of consumption. And we become ide we identify not around our role in the economy because it is it's abstracted away from us. We're not feeling it. We're not feeling exploited. We're not feeling like we're exploiters. We're, we're, we're in a market. We're in the market relationship and we are consuming within it. And that is what defines us. And, not, and then our, we, bring our polit we bring that consumption identity to politics, which means our politics become drained of actual class interest. And so that process is the process by which you see uh, power exercised ritually at the level of uh, participation by the middle class, where you hear a big, a big explosion thanks to uh, the Vietnam War, thanks to its horror, its aesthetic horror, but also its direct danger to the, the children of this middle class. But then with the uh, explosion of credit in the 70s and 80s, the, the new debt-based consumer society uh, tells those who were on the right side of the uh, labor pancake, the ones who were still around after the factories closed. Yeah, whose kids became lawyers and exactly. like a the, lot of the, that professionalized. The, 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 the flannel suit men were yeah. still useful in the American context of consumption. Yes. The consumers had to go elsewhere because the empire had to equalize productivity in order to sustain itself. It could not all be concentrated because you're fighting a Cold War. What are they supposed to do in Ch Germany and Japan? Are they supposed to rub sticks together? They have to have a domestic economy. They have to have a <laughs> d domestic industry, which means they eventually compete with you. And which means you've now created a global system, which means that your overfed middle working class has to be reduced. Because I think the American state is in some degree run by people who really believe in capitalism. Yes. So for them, the emergence – and this is – Marx is such a genius. He predicted this. It's insane. It's like he, he – there was an emergence of a transnational bourgeoisie. Yep. You know, literally in sort of the seats of empire around the world, you get the emergence of this class that has more in common with – you know, the way they would frame it today. A man in D Dubai is more in common with someone in New York than uh, New York and Detroit, right? So you have this establishment of this international bourgeoisie in a real way that Marx predicted. And so this is really important, I think, to, to why those sorts of things are, are quote-unquote allowed to happen, the betrayal of American workers that occurred in the service of global capital. Regardless of if you think about it, that's what happened. Exactly. And so now in, in, the, in the rubble of, uh, of the post-Keynesian consensus, uh, on the graveyard of the American working class as a self-aware uh, uh, self uh, political uh, grouping, we now have a... Ertzatz politics that is uh, defined by cultural conflict, but is generated by a material conflict between this transnational bourgeoisie in the form of the Democratic Party uh, and the the rump of the Taftites, the small holding capitalists, the 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 extraction industry, uh, uh, the the land based rentiers and and franchise holders of America uh, in the Republican Party. And it is in the context of the breaking down of the consumer deal. This had all been predicated on a bounty for everybody and upward mobility across generations. And that has broken down as the system is equalized, as, as the, that, uh, that surplus has been redistributed outward, and as the rate of, surplus, uh, the, the rate of uh, profit has declined. 
And in that context, now people are not imagining a future better for their children, which means they are now operating by a, uh, a nihilism. A, yeah, a tribal politics that is now disillusioned with all belief that the system can sustain them. And so our politics now is defined, yes, by uh, a class war, but not one where the working class is a bystander and participant without its knowledge in a greater conflict between uh, national uh, bourgeois and international bourgeois. Because now we've related the development of the Natsex state into the, uh, you know, vast terrain of you know class conflict in the 21st century i i was saying you know we, we've gone about an hour 10 now you know maybe we want to bring it down and talk about maybe post 9 11 21st century uh developments in the uh in the natsec world and kind of bring us up to date and then uh you know maybe go back out again about uh the big picture here well I, okay this is a good question then i i think that's perfect i have the question to make that point so you and I both were active supporters of the Bernie Sanders campaign for president in 1916 and in 2020. We both uh, were involved in the campaign itself in 2020 in some capacity or another. We obviously believed in it. We thought it was worth pursuing. We thought it was the left's best chance. Uh, and let's say, and it, it turns out that we were all wildly off uh, the degree of political uh, investment uh, that the working class, the most the most exploited within America have, and that that meant that uh, the the media footprint was completely different. The people, the people who needed to be paying attention, had turned off. So, but let's say that's not the case. Let's say Bernie won, uh, and maybe it, 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 uh, some things would have had to have been significantly different for that to have happened. But it's not totally outside the realm of possibility. Some freak events could have occurred. Maybe Joe Biden's uh, head explodes. I mean, the man has had a million strokes. His brain is turning into putty. Maybe he, ex- he died. Essentially, essentially. Uh, yeah, he, like he, he just just his head pops before he can become the 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 avatar of the uh, of the disunited Democratic opposition. Anyway, Bernie becomes president. He has inherited the system where power has been totally abstracted away from the presidency. He is now the ha- the the leader of this new nascent left wing opposition to the system. This self. Conscious articulation of a demand to not pursue this agenda. Uh, and he would be in the office representing that coalition, given the constraints we have. What realistically do you think Bernie could have accomplished in that framework? So there's, I think, a lot of different questions in that question. One of them is the relative strength of the, deep, of the so-called deep state. Right. right? And like, this is where we could talk about what has happened since 9-11. Right. So so you get the creation of course after 9/11 of this of this en- uh, enormous structure to fight uh to terrorism. Yeah. You get the establishment of the Department of Homeland Security and the increase of funding of of all of these intelligence activities. And of course you get the famous authorization to use military force um and it's it's various offshoots that essentially allow the president to deploy force without uh without congressional approval. And I think I, I should just emphasize the last time the United States declared war, do you know? Uh World War 2. June 40 Two against Romania, Bulgaria, and maybe Hungary. Yeah. Uh, and so, but we've of course undertaken over 250 military interventions since World War II. So obviously, the Congress has almost totally abdicated its responsibility. Yeah. But what happened? So this is really the question, right? Uh, the question is how strong is the deep state vis-a-vis a president? Um, and I think that has a lot to do with the president. Um, but I think you see with Obama that someone who genuinely, I think, wanted to do things the deep state didn't want him to do, he he lost. Most of the time, um, I would say, and I'd say that when, when you have Trump, the deep state just does what it wants. And, I, yeah, uh, I think with Obama, you, I think you have a genuine desire, but it wasn't that deeply rooted. It wasn't no, no, what he, he didn't cared care. About. Ultimately, he it's like it would no have been capital. nice. It would have been nice if I could have gotten okay. out of Afghanistan. So the deep state is now extremely professionalized, right? I don't think it's the rogues of the 50s and 60s. So the question that I ask myself is that is it's now all Harvard you know, are these people who are going to do those sorts of, but a professionalized Harvard, not a Kissinger Harvard. Right, yeah. You know, it's a different space now. The ruling elite is different than it was. It's a soft ruling elite. Yeah. You know, it's not the same thing. No, they're all, they all got a lot it's of feelings. It's not Colby, you know, it's not that, Angleton. Yeah, it's, it's a, they all got a lot of feelings. So we're living in ersatz thing. Yes. So like, this is the question, right? It's like an ersatz CIA. And obviously they're nefarious and obviously they're blah, 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 the, uh, a bad. They're and, doing and, bodies and spaces at Langley. Right, exactly. And so this is a, it's the millennial, <laughs> it's the millennial CIA. So how powerful it's, is it's that? It's the hug I don't box. Know. We're going to take you to the hug box. The care cube. 
<laughs> exactly. You go to care Cuban to say, so that's the question that I have about that. What, what type of CIA are we really dealing with? Um, who are the killers there? You know, Iraq and Afghanistan just weren't big enough. You have special forces guys and people like that, but a different thing. So then the question though, is what, what, what did you have done with Bernie? And at some point the campaign asked us to give like our, you know, dream, dream list. And essentially when I was thinking in like practical terms, a lot of it turned out to be study groups and just mapping the security state, like the old union power maps, because authority, I think it's, difficult to you cannot overemphasize authority is so diffuse yeah. so think about the atomic bomb we always hear about the football uh, but in actuality that there's like 12 points around the globe where people could essentially decide to like push us into nuclear war daniel ellsberg's most recent book is really excellent on this so authority and power is so diffuse because i think like in capitalism we talked about this um we are so alienated from the system the system now controls us we do not control the system yeah. and that only is not true that is not true uh, uh not only true for capitalism it is cool, uh, true for imperialism and so that's a big question right that wasn't the case in the 40s and the 50s right yeah and it is now yeah and so that that does suggest to me that bernie in, in power would have been what i would have expected him to be which is a, a necessary failure a, a a someone to raise a flag to to art, allow a movement to articulate itself and to assert political uh uh, uh, uh autonomy but that would i mean he wasn't going to get medicare for all passed either he sure as shit wasn't going to do anything substantive about American empire. I think you would have been able to see a couple hundred base closures, like really egregious ones. Yeah. Cause there's some like truly, it's egregious ridiculous. Ones. Yeah. Uh, I think you, so in like, I think June, 2019 or 2020 uh, must've been 2020. Like the Democrats refused to cut the budget by 10%. I think you could have seen a budget cut of something like that. Yeah. You know, like a move in the right direction. A shave off of the shawarma yeah, hunk. Exactly. Yeah. But I think it would have been really hard to take on the enormous entrenched interests that represent the security state in this yeah, country. Because the only thing that can counteract them, she's corny and cheesy as it is, is actual people because the institutions exist to serve their own s structures. They don't even require human intervention at this point. It, it, you, it has to be outside of that system and that the only thing that is there is numbers. So uh, that's, it, it reasserts the primacy of organizing uh, as, as the locus of any kind of struggle. Yeah, and that would – I mean I, I always thought about when I was like thinking big, you know, labor unions should have articulated foreign policies. Absolutely. You know? Like this should be something uh, that, that it's important for Americans. To replace to the old AFL-CIA. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, and I mean listen, uh, we're, we're not on the verge of a transnational working class uprising, yeah. but at least, you know, like as long as we're totally in opposition, at least articulate a different world. Yeah. If that's the best you can do. Yeah. I have one just final question. Oh, perfect. To like rope it all in and maybe bring us all home Hell to yeah. the bring us home, current buddy. moment. Yes. Towards towards the very beginning of this conversation, you guys were talking about uh, FDR's administration and his potential move to create a new deal for the world. I think we're seeing the Biden administration uh, attempt to bring even minor improvements or concessions to the welfare state, uh, social democracy at home, uh, but always in this framework of adversarial competition abroad, increasingly specifically against China. So I guess what I'm asking is how do you guys see this modern NATSEC establishment as affecting or constraining even domestic agendas? I think that's a really good, uh, really important question because I think in some sense it's just, you know, what's been happening since the beginning of this country, which is the creation of an enemy from, you know, native people uh, to enslaved people to, you know um, – uh, Ch Chinese during the uh, 1880s and so on and so on. So I think there's always that demonization linked to sort of providing for the welfare of the American citizenry. Um, but I think that uh, what you're going to see is essentially an ersatz version of what we've seen before, because unlike the U.S. and Soviet Union, uh, the U.S. and China are just incredibly economically embedded. You really can't get these two countries apart. So you're going to see, I think, in both countries, actually, the articulation of uh, geopolitical tension. Uh, but basically, it's going to be smoke and mirrors as both seem one produces and one consumes. Uh, and um, the, the, the security state is just used to basically give out spoils amongst the domestic elite. Yeah. And China is in no position to replace America as the consumer of last resort in the global capitalist chain. Like they're doing, they're trying to build it, but it's not anywhere near there yet. Destroy the world. Yeah. So, uh, so we're going to have to see some sort of, uh, uh, 
some I, I i think yeah it's like people talk about a war it's got to be at some point 100 years from now or something they're just gonna have to have like a merger just china america china america let's do it that was a tom freeman book yeah i mean it seems like come on let's do it let's sign on the dotted line uh but so we're gonna have uh this yes this ratcheting of tension with, with china but i think yeah it will be managed at every level to prevent it from turning into anything that can't be uh walked back uh and coupled with i think the closest thing a democrat in the 21st century can offer to a new deal which is not uh, a social democratic state coming back but just a democratization of quantitative easing because if we want to define like the the post obama era uh macro like economically uh, as uh, just the recapitaliz- the public recapitalization of the finance industry at the expense of the dispossession of the remaining middle class and specifically the uh, the laboring part of the middle class. Uh, that has now led to an acceleration of crisis at the bottom of debt uh, uh, and of uh, inability to engage in the fucking market that has to be corrected somehow. And so what we're getting is the turning of the spigot to put some of that money into the hands of regular people. I think that's right. And I wouldn't be surprised if you see some form of UBI through like cryptocurrency funded. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> yes. If they can like <laughs> seriously if, if <laughs> cryptocurrency could take the place of Wall Street speculation in the twenties. It's going to. I think it's it I think it already like, has. It becomes the thing that people put their money oh God, shit, that is what it is. It's it? absolutely it's, it's fi- the twenties again. Increasing abstraction through Wonderful. like currency, which is even more it's an abstraction of an abstraction. I mean it's we wild. dance around it a lot, but all of this really does only point in one direction, which is not a, a catastrophic, <laughs> catastrophic con- explosion of these contradictions. I, I would there's think nothing, so. There's, it is a runaway train, that, and all we've been talking for this last hour and a half, the brakes have been broken. There's no, there. It is only capital is accelerated beyond any accountability. It, it's absolutely the case, I, and um, yeah, and I think you're going to see those contradictions continue to express themselves. And as they do, I think the U.S. is going to slowly retreat from like the the ridiculous expanse of its empire. Like, is it really going to be dominant in East Asia and China's backyard forever? I would be surprised if in 50 years it is. And those military forces, uh, they're not just going to be wiped off of the map. They're going to come oh, back. No. Yes. Oh, they're oh, going yes. to come back home. They're going to oh, come yes. back home. Uh, and so, yeah, so we're going to see a lot of things, I think, get get steadily worse unless something changes. That's, that's always the case. That's all we can ever hope for. Well, thank you very much, Daniel, for coming out here and talking to us. Great work. I want to plug his book again, uh, Democracy in Exile. What's his name? Hans Speyer. Hans Speyer. Hans Speer. And the Rise of the Defense Intellectual. It's a great book. It's a classic. One of, my, uh, one of the best of the Star Wars films. <laughs> Rise of the Defense Intellectual. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you. This has been uh, a bonus on Matt Christman's Dead Presidents, and I believe we're coming back ne- uh, for our next episode should be on uh, the 60s and uh, Nixon era. If I know my scheduling of this, this should come out like late August. Oh, man, that'll uh, be which a is hilarious because we're recording this in May. Every, don't, any, everybody, don't eat the brown acid. So uh, maybe uh, by that time, Bitcoin will have collapsed and I'll have to uh, edit out all this endpoint, but uh, hopefully we'll stay prescient. Uh, So tune in for the next regular episode and thank you for listening. Bye-bye.